ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار وما قل وكفى خير مما كثر والها وانما توعدون لات وما انتم بمعجزين there are moments in the history of time moments that collide with the course of history and change the course of events forever there are very few such moments one such moment was a time when the world was enveloped in darkness it was a time where there was injustice everywhere and it was a time where a young man had retreated away from the world on top of the world into a cave that time was jahiliya that place was the arabian peninsula and that man was muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam he had just turned 40 and it was his habit before allah chose him to retreat away from his people away from the darkness away from the injustice to get into the cave to contemplate to retreat to think about creation on one such day allah made a decision allah chose to interfere and replace the darkness in the world with light allah chose to replace injustice with justice and allah chose to change the course of history forever by filling the world with mercy that day this man was anointed that day he went from being muhammad the citizen who brought mercy to the people around him in makka to muhammad the messenger who was appointed to bring mercy to the entire world that day the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the cave of hira he had his first experience with the divine and that day the angel came down and asked him to read and the very first words of the quran were revealed iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khala read in the name of your lord who created that day the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was terrified he was filled with terror and he was filled with fear he came down from that mountain confused he rushed down from the mountain he had only one thing in his mind and he had only one place on his mind and one person on his mind and that was his friend his supporter his spouse his companion his beloved wife khadija radhiyallahu anha he rushed home to his wife and he was fearful he was trembling he was in a state of shock when he came home he asked her to wrap him up zammiluni zammiluni and she saw his terrible state trembling sweating fearful she wrapped him up and after he had calmed down after the heat was restored to his body after he came to a state of calm he related to her what happened and he told her his experience and he was very very fearful and he said laqad khashitu ala nafsi and he kept repeating that i am afraid for myself i am afraid something is happening to me i am afraid my mind 
may be going insane. Khadija radiallahu anha, she was a smart woman. She was full of wisdom. She was full of foresight. She said some words to him in this great moment in history that really deserve to be written with gold. She changed the environment from an environment of fear to an environment of hope. She was someone who was full of wisdom. And she said to him, Kalla, no way, never. Wallahi, Kalla, Abishir. And then she said, Abishir, rejoice. Now here is the Prophet ﷺ, he's fearful. He's afraid he's going insane or mad. And she's telling him to rejoice, Abishir. Look at the, the difference of mood. She, she, she sought to change the mood from an environment in a mood of darkness and fear and terror to an environment of celebration. Why? Because she was full of foresight. She could see into the future. She said, Kalla abushib, fa wallahi la yufzik Allahu abada. She said, Rejoice because by Allah, your Lord will never forsake you. By Allah, your Lord, Allah will never forsake you, will never humiliate you. Why did she say that? Why was she so full of confidence at a time even the Prophet ﷺ was full of fear? Because she knew him. No one knows a person like his own family, especially his spouse. So she knew him very, very well. She knew him before she met him. His reputation had preceded him. She knew him like the people of Mecca knew him. And that was nothing but good. What they knew of him was nothing but good. He was known as a sadiq al-Amin. And then she knew him as an employer when he began to work for her. And as an employer, what she knew from him was nothing but good. And eventually she proposed to him and then they became married. And they lived many happy years together. And as a, a wife of this amazing husband, what she knew from him was nothing but good. So she knew this person. She knew that he was the best of the best. She knew he had some amazing qualities and something amazing was in store for his future. And then she gave the reasons why Allah would not forsake him. And she began to list his qualities. And this is just a, such an amazing and beautiful summary of who the Messenger of Allah wasallam was. That's going to be the topic of our khutbah. She said, Kalla abushib. فَوَاللَّهِ لَا يُفْزِيكَ اللَّهُ أَبَدًا She said, إِنَّكَ لَا تَصِلُ الرَّحِمُ Number one, you are the one who maintains the ties of kinship. You are good to your families. She said, وَتَصْدُقُ الْحَدِيثِ And you are the one who is ever truthful in his speech. Anything that ever came out of the mouth of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa even before prophethood, was nothing but the truth. And people knew that. And she said, وَتَحْمِلُ الْكَلْ and you are the one who bears the burdens of others. Any person is in pain in Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ shared that pain. If there was any sorrow in anyone's house, he shared their sorrow. If there was any misfortune, he shared in their feelings and in their emotions. وَتَحْمِلُ kal, He bore the burdens of others. And then she said, وَتَكْسِبُ الْمَعْدُومِ You always help those who are cut off, those who are destitute. Anyone who's in trouble, who needs any help, they knew where to turn. And then she said, الضيف, And you are the one who is kind and hospitable to his guests. And then she said, ala She began to describe him with characteristic after characteristic. And finally she said, And you are the one who restores the rights to those whose rights are due, those whose rights are snatched. This was, in essence, the life of the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam before he was anointed. He was ever in the service of others. His entire life can be summarized in this beautiful statement, this beautiful description. Someone who helped others, someone who cared about others, someone who felt the emotions of others, someone who was trustworthy, someone people could trust and confide in, someone who solved the problems of people. This was the state of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He was a Sadiq al Amin before he was a Rasul al Nabi. He had to be a Sadiq al Amin. He had to be the trustworthy one and the truthful one. Someone who earned the trust of his people before he became the Prophet and the Messenger. This was a very, very important part of his personality. And that's why Khadija was so filled with hope. 
and so inspired and she gave him comfort and restored his confidence that something amazing was in store for the future. Now the Prophet ﷺ was always in the service of others and then when he came into Islam and he was anointed and he continued or he began his ministry as the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he raised that bar even further. He continued that life, those essential characteristics. And he became someone who was always in the service of others in a more refined and perfect way. So to skip forward, when he came to Medina for instance, this was another amazing and great moment in history. He came to Medina after his entire 13 years in Mecca with this long struggle and persecution and just a handful of people accepted the message. He found refuge in the city of Medina and the people accepted him as their new leader. So he arrived after making the hijrah and this was a moment where everyone in the city was talking about him sallallahu alaihi wasallam and all eyes were on him and when news came that he was arriving the entire population came out in the streets. So among them were people who had embraced Islam. They wanted to see their messenger. Among them were people who were thinking about it. They wanted to see who this man was. And among them were people who never thought about it. They just wanted to see what the fuss was. Among these people was a Jewish rabbi by the name of Abdullah ibn Salam. Abdullah ibn Salam, he said, I saw the people rushing out. And they were saying, Qadima Rasulullah, Qadima Rasulullah, the Messenger of Allah is here. The Messenger of Allah is here. So he said, I followed the crowd and I wanted to see who this man was. So he said, when he came and he saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, I studied his face. And he said, the first thing I noticed was that his face was not the face of a liar. He had a noble face. Just from his appearance, I was impressed. And then he said the first words. He said, كَانَ أَوَّلُ شَيْءٍ تَكَلَّمَ بِهِ أَنْ قَالُ He said the first words I heard him utter when he arrived in Medina were these beautiful words. And he related them there in hadith today. He said, أَيُّهَا nas, أَفْشُ salam, وَصِلُوا الْأَرْحَامِ وَأَطْعِمُ الطَّعَامِ وَصَلُّوا بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّاسُ نِيَامِ تَدْخُلُوا الْجَنَّةَ بِسَلَامِ He said some beautiful words. Now you can imagine this moment, the entire population is looking at this man to see what his message will be, what his words will be, what his demeanor will be. And what he says, O people, afshu salam, spread peace amongst yourselves. He said, O people, wasilu al-arham, maintain the ties of family. And he said, O people, wa'atarimu ta'am, feed the needy, feed each other. And he said, wasallu bil-layl. Pray during the night while the rest of the people are asleep. Tadkhulul Jannata bi salam, and you shall enter paradise with peace. What a beautiful summary of the religion of Islam. What a beautiful summary. How can you summarize something more perfectly and more in in such a perfect way and balance? That this is what Islam is all about: spreading peace among people, maintaining family relations, you know, serving others by feeding them. And then your personal worship, worshiping Allah personally while the people are asleep. This is the path to paradise. If you look at these four characteristics, three of them have to do with service to others. And the last one has to do with serving Allah. So this is a simple summary of Islam. This was a beautiful message the Prophet ﷺ brought to his life. Even before prophethood, he perfected, perfected it during his life in Mecca. And he refined it even further when he arrived in Medina. And he continually taught people to help others, to give, to be in the service of others. Uh, in Arabic, being in the service of others or helping others is sadaqah. So he used to teach his companions in Medina. He used to teach them ala kulli Muslim sadaqah. And I'll end with this advice of his, such a beautiful advice. You know, many of us, when we think about these things, we might, you know, shaitan comes to our minds and we'll say, you know, sadaqah is for those who have money. It's not for me, or that's for that person, or this verse is talking about that person. This hadith is about that person. We always like to deflect these things away from us. So the Prophet ﷺ, he was a master teacher. So one time in an audience, he taught them, he said, ala kulli Muslim sadaqah. He said, every single Muslim should perform sadaqah, should help others, should give charity. 
So the companions in the audience are sitting there, and one of them asked a question. قَالْ أَرَأَيْتَ إِلَّمْ يَجِدْ So someone asked the Messenger of Allah, O Messenger of Allah, what if I don't have the means? It's a question all of us may be asking at some point in our lives. You know, when you're in a fundraising dinner, they're asking you to contribute. And sometimes, you know, you may be a college student or you're going through financial difficulties and you might think, how can I help? So this companion in the audience, he said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, what if we don't have the means to give sadaqah, financial charity? What did the Prophet say, sallallahu alayhi wa Just think about what you would say. Maybe make dua until things get better and then you can help. The Prophet said to him, Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, يَعْمَلُ بِيَدَيْهِ فَيَمْفَعُ نَفْسَهُ يَتَصَدَّى He said, go out and do something with your hands so you can earn something to help yourself and help others. In other words, he said, go get a job and make some money so you can help the community. So first he said, everyone should give sadaqah. And someone asked, what if we don't have something to give sadaqah with? He said, go get a job, do something with your hands so you can help yourself and then help the communities. Now someone in the audience, he still asked him. He said, أَرَأَيْتَ إِلَّمْ يَسْتَطِعْ What if I can't even do that? There is someone thinking in the audience, what if I don't have the means to get a job or physically I can't create the resources to help others. Now the Prophet, he didn't say, okay, that's enough. He gave him an option too. There was no person left behind in his teaching. He said, يُعِينُ ذَا الْحَاجَةِ malhuf." He said, if you can't give money in charity, if you can't get a job to create money or create the resources to give in charity, then he said, at least go out and help someone in need or in distress. He said, go out and physically help someone who's needy or in distress. So this man or another person in the audience, he asked, he continued, he said, أَرَأَيْتَ إِلَّمْ يَسْتَطَعْ you can imagine another companion now he's saying, what if I can't even do that? Now this is an amazing lesson. Allah chose these companions and Allah chose the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to teach us for the end of time. Any question we have today, likely it is answered in the Quran and the Sunnah. The companions did our job for us. So someone asked, what if I can't go out and help someone physically? So the Prophet, he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, يَأْمُرُ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ أَوْ الْخَيْرِ then the least you can do is go out and teach the good and teach, the, to teach um, virtue and forbid the evil in other narrations. So at least teach people something. Teach people to do something good. Point them in the right direction. So this is one of the final steps. Now, someone still asked a further question. أَرَأَيْتَ إِلَّمْ يَفْعَلْ What if a person cannot even do that? In terms of helping someone, in terms of giving charity, or in terms of even teaching someone or pointing them in the right direction. And the last thing the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he said, يُمْسِكُ عَنِ الشَّرْفَ فَإِنَّهَا صَدَقَةً He said, then stay out of trouble, and that is your charity. Withhold your evil from the people, and that is your charity. The least thing that we can do, if we can't contribute to the solution, if we can't be part of the solution, if we can't help in any way, at least don't be part of the problem. So look at the amazing wisdom and insight of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alihi Wasallam. There was no person left behind. He began by saying, Ala kulli Muslim sadaqa. Every single Muslim deserves to give sadaq. And then through the step-by-step -step process, he gave the priorities where every single person can be part of it. No one is left behind. The very least you can do, it's very hard to imagine as someone who can't do any of these steps. But if there is such a person, the least you can do is don't be part of the problem. Withhold your evil from the people. So don't contribute to the problem. Stay out of trouble. These are the amazing wisdoms of the Prophet ﷺ. We ask Allah to make us among his followers. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد. So today we're looking at a very important part of the Prophet's legacy, which is helping others, being in the service of others, caring for his ummah, caring for his people, and we saw. Or we looked at a glimpse of his life before prophethood. 
These Prophets, the Anbiya and the Rusul, the Prophets and Messengers were chosen by Allah for a reason. They were the best of their people. So you'll find many of their amazing qualities even before they were chosen. And when they were chosen and they became under the guidance of Allah, under the shade of revelation, their life was perfected even more. So our Prophet wasallam, he was someone who always helped others. That was one of his divine, defining characteristics. If you look at his life, you can't help but fall in love with this person. And when he came into Islam, he continued that tradition of serving others, helping others. And he continued to teach people at every moment of his life in the most effective ways imaginable how to help others and how to be in the service of others. Sometimes we as Muslims, we lose sight of this priority and this mission. Sometimes we feel, you know, being religious or being close to Allah means praying a thousand rak'ahs or engaging in a lot of personal worship, which is very important. But if you look at the instructions of the Prophet ﷺ when he came to Medina, there are four characteristics he mentioned. The last one, and that may be the most important one, but it's the last one. Out of four, there's only one characteristic that has to do with personal worship or ritual worship. The first three he emphasized with spreading peace amongst each other, saying the greetings, saying salam, and living a life of peace, and then feeding others, maintaining your family relations. This is what Islam is all about. It's about peace. It's about family. It's about serving others. And finally, it's about worshiping Allah. Worshiping Allah while the people are asleep. This is an important characteristic. This is pure worship, sincere worship. You know, it's easy to worship Allah when you're with a thousand other people. But imagine when people are asleep, what do you do in, that, in, in those moments? When people are asleep and people can't see you. You know, what's your life in those moments? And we saw in some of the classes we do, how the life of the Prophet ﷺ, even during the night, when no one was watching, except maybe perhaps his wife Aisha radiallahu anha, or one of his wives or one of the companions, they would observe, after everyone falls asleep, he would get up and he would spend his nights in tears and in worship, worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is the formula. I'll end with a, another statement of the Prophet wasallam. You know, ask yourselves, who's the closest to Allah? Who do you think Allah loves the most in the world? Who are the people who are most beloved to Allah? If you think about that, we might come up with various different answers. We might come up with the answer is the man who memorized the most Quran and Hadith, or the one who teaches the most, or the one who has this or that, or the one who worships and prays a thousand rak'ahs a day, or so on and so forth. Generally, when you read our books of history, these are the people we praise. These are the people we um, elevate and consider to be the most beloved to Allah. But the Prophet ﷺ, he said in an amazing hadith, he said, when someone asked him, Ayyu nasi ahabbu ilallah? Someone asked him this question. They said, who among the people are the most beloved to Allah? And they asked him the flip side of that, Wa ayyu al-a'mali ahabbu ilallah? And which deeds are the most beloved to Allah? The Prophet ﷺ, he gave an answer that may surprise many of us. He said, أَحَبُّ النَّاسِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَمْثَعُهُمْ لِلنَّاسِ He said, the most beloved to Allah among the people are those who benefit their fellow human beings the most. Those who bring the most benefit to their fellow human beings. That's the most beloved of creation to Allah Azza wa Jalla. And then he said, وَأَحَبُّ الْأَعْمَالِ Then he gave some example. And the best of deeds, the most beloved of deeds to Allah Azza wa Jalla. أَحَبُّ الْأَعْمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ he said, Sururun tadkhuluhu ala muslimin. Such a simple thing. He said that one of the best deeds, most beloved deeds to Allah, is just your bringing happiness to a fellow Muslim. Bringing happiness in the heart of a fellow Muslim. Sururun tadkhuluhu ala muslimin. Aw takshifu anhu kurbatan. Or you relieving a distress from your fellow Muslim. Someone who's in trouble, who's going through hard times, you help him out or her out and you relieve some of their burden and their distress. Or you relieve a debt from a fellow human being. You pay off some of their debt. You help them out of this difficult situation. Or you, or you relieve some of the hunger from a fellow human being by feeding him. 
you, you relieve some of that hunger that person may be feeling. And then he said something amazing. He said, "Wala in amshi ma akhin li fi hajatin, ahabu ilayya min an aataki fa fi hadha al masjid shahran fi masjid al Madina." He said, "For me, now this is the Prophet speaking. He said, for me to walk holding the hand of my brother for, and fulfilling one of his needs, for me to hold the hand of my brother and help him in one of his needs is more beloved to me than for me to make i'tikaf." in this masjid of mine in the city of Medina for one entire month. So look at this amazing perspective of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. He said, وَمَنْ كَفَّ غَضَبَهُ And he went on and on. وَمَنْ كَفَّ غَضَبَهُ سَتَرَهُ اللَّهُ عَوْرَةً He who suppresses his anger so it doesn't hurt others, Allah will uh, cover up his faults on the Day of Judgment. وَمَنْ كَذَمَ غَيْذَهُ وَلَوْ شَاءَ أَنْ يُمْضِيَهُ أَمْضَاهُ and he said same thing, someone who suppresses his anger, where he can act upon it, but he suppresses it, he doesn't act upon it. Mala Allahu qalbahu raja'an yawm al qiyamah. Allah will fill his heart with hope on the day of judgment. You suppress your anger in this life, so you don't act upon it, you don't harm anyone else, then Allah will substitute that with hope on the day of judgment. وَمَنْ مَشَى مَا أَخِيهِ فِي حَاجَةٍ حَتَّى يُثَبِّتَهَا لَهُ and the last thing he said, for you to walk with your brother or your sister in one of his needs and help him in that need of his or her, Allah will strengthen your feet on the day where your feet need to be strengthened. The day where the day of judgment, everyone shall be standing before their Lord. So look at this amazing perspective of the Prophet ﷺ. It changes the narrative, it changes the perspective, it changes how we look at things. The most important, one of the most important things for us is to help our fellow human beings. We should all ask ourselves, are we helping others? Are we part of the solution? Or are we part of the problem? In communities, uh, are we helping and contributing to the success of the communities? Or are we not? If there are people in distress in our country and all around the world, are you helping out in any way that you can? And don't say that, you know, I'm not rich, I'm not a businessman, I don't have a job, or I'm not doing that well. This is for every single person as the Prophet taught us. We ask Allah to make us the followers of His, make us among those who help others. May Allah make all of us beloved to Him. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqa wa rizukna tiba'a. Wal ba'tila ba'tila wa rizukna shlinaba. Allahumma tawafana muslimin. Wal hikna bil salihin. غير خزايا ولا مفتونين اللهم أصلح لنا ديننا الذي هو عصمة أمرنا وأصلح لنا دنيانا التي فيها معاشنا وأصلح لنا آخرتنا التي إليها معادنا واجعل الحياة زيادة لنا من كل خير والموت راحة لنا من كل شر اللهم اكفنا بحلالك عن حرامك وأغننا بفضلك عن من سواك اللهم آمين وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد